Good morning, I'm just walking around because I'm here by myself. I've only got one pair of hands, the camera up and over elsewhere. I'm going to have a play with Bertie's uh, equation today. Somebody says that I've got to try and look more at the camera because it can't hear me too well. No, I'll try and clear it up as I go along. Bertie said that E equals MC squared and it represented like that. But your viewpoint from a two-dimensional perspective or representation is there. But if you look from here towards it in the direction of light, what you actually get is a straight line. That line carries over, that line becomes a dot, and E kind of goes away from you, according to that. If you look at it from this perspective, you get this. M is a dot, C is a straight line, and E goes away from you. If you look at it from the E perspective, then C becomes a dot on one side, that becomes C here, M is here, and E is zero. So if you base your value here as the center point, that becomes zero, that becomes an infinity, and that becomes an infinity. And as, as I displayed yesterday, in order for infinity to exist, infinity must be two times itself, not one time itself. That's the easy bit. I'll go through it one more time. 2D representation of all three. Two-dimensional representation viewing from C. 2D representation viewing from M. And a 2D representation viewing from E. When you view from the energy point of view, you have two times infinity. But it also means that the closer to zero you get, the greater the energy becomes. We've said that because when you put a magnet there, at zero with its energy, there is more energy in this magnet at zero than at any other place upon the line. That's the easy bit. Let's just get rid of these parts and change what we see. This is a two-dimensional representation of a 3D spatial state. But when you view from any angle that you care to desire, you, your eye, becomes the fourth dimension. You're looking from the outside in at the object. If you look at that pen right now, it has got three dimensional states. If I pose the pen to you there and I move it off the screen, it changes from a dot straight in front of you to a line from your angle of perspective. This never changed. The viewing point, which is you, changed. So this remains three dimensional. The camera or the viewpoint becomes a fourth dimension. If you view things in the fourth dimension like this, you see something different. If we take Bertie's equation, I need to move it to the center of the board to make it a little bit more constructive. 
and we've got that. Okay. If we now apply this is the simplest formula we can do, and we say that C is a circle, a sphere, and M is a sphere, is a sphere. Because all of these are equal to each other, all you actually get at the end of the day is a sphere. Okay? If we now put the center of our sphere and plot Mr. Einstein's fantastic equation, but we do it on a sphere, we end up with C going around the equator, sorry for the not quite perfect line, M going in the polar axis, and E going off that way. The problem with that is when you look at this equation here and you turn the ball like this, you've got M here going up the screen to there. You have C coming to here and you have E to there. It doesn't matter how you look at it, Einstein only drew part of it. There's one, two, three, four parts there. And if we turn the ball over, guess what you've got? You've got another one, two, three, four. That means Mr. Einstein, in his brilliance, labelled the universe as one-eighth of all of what it was. He missed so much, it's, it, it doesn't get funny anymore. I apply a lot of this stuff, of magnets, because they are the only constant source of energy there is on the planet without actually having to put energy in. They're very good instructional tools. They provide energy, they provide mass, and they defy gravity. They take all the concepts of everything that you use today that you can't find a direct solution for without having to put energy in. This beats them all. My mate, the choo-choo train. The train runs on a track, okay? We all know what the track looks like. We've got two parallel lines and we've got a load of sleepers. Or a ladder, yeah? Not a problem, that's what it looks like. And the train sits on and goes on it and the wheels go around and all the rest of it. I don't need to explain any of that to you. Have a think. If a magnet comes towards another magnet, north and south, they're attracted. And if a magnet comes to a magnet, south to south or north to north, it's repelled. So how can you use two at the same time against themselves? Well, what you need to do is apply Einstein's equation, by the way, which he stole when he was in the patent office. He was nothing more than a plagiarist. Nobody likes to admit that Albert Einstein was a plagiarist. Yes, he was clever to some extent. That's why he was working in the patent office, going through all the documents to make sure that the other dumb so-and-so's behind him, he would turn around and say, that's good, that's no good, that's good. But while he was there, he was reading all the work, he was taking a bit from this and a bit from that, a bit from that, and he suddenly had a brainwave. When he glued it all together from all these different people, he says, ah, I've got something good, E equals MC squared. He stole it, he didn't come up with it. Okay, let's, let's get this very, very clear. Albert Einstein was a pirating, plagiarist, thief. Simple. Watch this. If you take a magnet, 
We'll call this a bar magnet. You know, a nice long, long, long magnet like that. Something like that, but much, much longer, like the width of a train track. That means there's half of it is north and half of it is south, isn't it? Good. As long as you know that one. By the way, this was all shown on my video to the Royal Navy 37 years ago. If we now take our train track, we'll put the, the track in in a minute, and we'll put our bar magnet like that. And we'll say that this is the south, and this is the north. What we'll do is, under the train, I'll need something to represent me train. Here's my train. It's going to go along the track. Okay? So underneath my train, I am going to put a row of four magnets. Like that. I'm going to make that one south north that one south north that one north south and that one north south you lot in your ultimate wisdom of being very 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 clever a lot more clever than all the physicists and the teachers because they refuse to acknowledge what you're about to see if I now take my magnet and I bring it down, that south, the first south, will now pull towards the north. When it reaches here, we've now got a south plus a south pulling towards the magnet. When it gets to there, this magnet is now in the toroidal state, therefore it is a null. This is in pull, and number three is just started to go into pull. When you go to there, we've now got a north-north condition, which is a push. We've got this one entering the null, and this one in a pull. And it will go across with no input of energy whatsoever, like that. So that goes pull, pull, push, pull, push, pull, push, pull. You got that? If we now take our problem and build it correctly, you now have two railway sleepers of an infinite length with 45 degree bar magnets and your train track, which is, or your train, which is comprised of four magnets with the correct poles. I'll just do it the other way. That means this is a south and that's a north. That will go along there forever with no input of energy and it will do so very, very fast. If you play the sticky magnet game, have you got any idea how fast that slap as their magnets come together is? You're combining the complete inertia force of the whole of the goddamn universe into two magnets. This will go extremely fast. But how do you control the speed? By changing the orientation of this bar. The moment you make that bar equal to itself, it will go nowhere. That's all you need to change all the speed in the world. Now, if you try to now overlay that with an Einstein equation, we can go like that. We can say now that this becomes the mass of the object, which is M. We've got the constant, which is the parallel between the two. And we've got the energy, which relies within the magnet. K 
Can you tell me right now where does the energy go in? There is no input of energy. The energy remains constant. The energy remains constant along all of this line and it's always, always zero. Because it doesn't matter where you apply this constant at any one time, you will always have a zero for the mass. That results in the equation that magnetic energy divided by the inertia equals energy, as what I've said. It also says that the closer to zero you get, the greater the energy is. Thank you very much.